happy and healthy new year um, as we get ready to land the plane with the paradigm shift episode 145 with a very exclusive special guest today um, Dr. Nicola Pear, who I personally could not be more excited about. But first, we're going to bring on Big Dave, as usual, my partner in crime. Let's get this party started. Happy New Year, guys. Let me know a big goal, big scary goal. Hello, Dave. Happy New Year. There you go, Hey, what's going on? Hey, what's up? Yeah. Real white mic. Go. Where are you? In Cabo. Still, of course you are. Still, I am. I am. I am. I'm playing golf with my son and friends and family all around me. It's been an incredible end of the year. Yes, it has. And we had a great call out this week. And I got to say, Cabo looks good on you, Dave. It does, man. You can do everything. You know, I vacation every day, but uh, when in a harmonious fashion, I wait uh, more of the vacation time time and activity that i don't get paid for uh i value it and enjoy it immensely and that's the the last week of the year for me yeah and, and by the way you never look more handsome i don't want to boost your ego because i know ego is something we want to tame but i gotta be honest well if uh anything ever happens between you and your fiance i'm available <laughs> the bromance has gotten weirder on another level exactly we have an awesome guest to land the plane with on 2023, uh, Dr. Nicole LaPera. Before we bring her on, uh, you and I will get after it right away. Uh, New Year's Eve, what do you got planned? What's going on? Well, you know, I try to live my life on East Coast time, so I celebrate New Year's Eve in New York fashion. Uh, so I like to uh, go to a fancy dinner with uh, my wife and other couples. And then we have a neighborhood uh, a very wealthy neighbor who has brought in Ludacris and Nelly. And uh, the rumor has it is we're going to be hanging out with Warren G and Snoop uh, at his house uh, performing there. And uh, I'll celebrate the nine o'clock ball drop and uh, do a uh, Irish exit uh, without saying goodbye around 10 o'clock, uh, maybe extend till 10 o'clock my normal and winding routine. But uh we have uh, like to stay at home. So I'm, I'm flying home today from Cabo. I'm going to play some golf and uh, with my son. And it's going to be an amazing uh, daily practice. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, you're very, very unique in the way that you look at things. One of the many things I love about you. Do you look at January 1st as some sort of fresh start or, or like new goals and stuff like that? Or is it just another day for you? Oh, no. You know, I utilize milestones and quantitative analysis comparative uh, with the dependent variable of time. Uh, so I like to use as a marker in the trajectory of where I want to be or better. Where was I January 1st of, of last year, personally, experientially, giving and receiving wise, and within the context of time, uh, seeing exactly how the acceleration, aggregation, and compounding uh, exponentially of, of the things that I'm not capable of understanding, which is how my behaviors are contributing to uh, the outcomes, results, and consequences that I want in my life for better. And so, although I don't attach my emotions to next New Year's Eve saying, oh, you know, I want to make over a billion dollars this year, or other things uh, that are arbitrary and capricious or lack the understanding of the infinite uh, physics of time or applied mathematics that we exist in, for me, it's just speed and velocity and momentum. So I'll look and see, uh, backwards quantitatively, hey, where was the acceleration, the aggregation, and the compounding of the results and uh, consequences in my life? And how can I improve my behaviors next year so that I can double the amount of money I make as fast as I can? I can double the experiences I'm having as fast as I can. I can double the lessons that I'm learning. I can double the size, scope, and scale of my community. So it's just a different perspective. I'm an odd bird when it comes to that, but I will tell you, uh, and your proof uh, in that as well, that the people that takes pe take pieces and parts of what I teach and utilize it uh, within the context of their own value system uh, are extremely passionate, purposeful, and profitable in their lives. Beautifully said. And I'll say this, you know, a lot, and then we'll bring on Dr. Nicole, I don't want to waste any more time. Um, you know, a lot of people measure year's end by like business and stuff, and our business continues to grow, and I'm very grateful for that. But 2023 for me personally, Dave, 
was the most growth I ever had spiritually with the Course in Miracles Kabbalah, under, being more available for some of the stuff that you teach me. And uh, that's transformative stuff right there. I'm so proud of that. Yeah, well, you're reaching that age of a quantum shift. And I encourage everyone, women reach it a little bit earlier than men. But as we uh, go through the quantum shift, uh, spirituality, uh, inspiration, uh, awareness become more critical in our existence and our journey. There she is, the highlight of our year. The, hello, hello. I, <laughs> good the morning. The grand finale. Dr. Nicole, great to see you again. How are you? I'm great. So, so good to connect with you, re reconnect with you, I should say, uh, Craig. And so excited to meet you, David. I'm honored to be here to close out all that is 2023, wildly enough. <laughs> yes. yes. And first and foremost, I want to give you congratulations. Um, obviously, the commercial success speaks for itself, but the impact that this book is having on so many people, I mean, that's what it's all about. And congratulations on yet another home run with your book. Thank you. Thank you. It is for me, this of the three books, I think is while I put so much into all of my books, there's just so much of my own self, my heart, not to be cliche, because so much of it is about reconnecting. So finally now being at the space of being able to see the service and the impact that it's having is just so overwhelming for me, all of the feels. Yeah, I love it. And this is going to be a good frequency for all of us right now. Um, so many things that Dr. Nicole talks about has to do with love and so forth. And Dr. Nicole, I'm just curious, straight off the cuff, have you ever read A Course in Miracles? Yes, absolutely have. Fan, I imagine? Um, funny, I read a page of it or so each and every morning, to be honest. So I just got about an hour or two ago, I just put it down. So yes, a fan for me, it's just a moment of my day, which is in the morning time for me that allows me to speak to your point, Craig, in terms of my own spiritual development, to just sit with myself, read the words, reconnect with the message. And for me, that's just been foundationally important in terms of how I then show up throughout the course of my day to, to serve others. Yeah, love it. Uh, so many places we could take this conversation. I want to dive in with some of the cool stuff about your book and so forth. And I know you talk about a lot about developing emotional resilience. And I just think that's so beautiful for the audience right now that's listening that might not understand what that means. What does that mean and why is it so important for you? For me, it's so important because I have seen in my own life and as well as in the community, both individuals that I worked with when I did a more traditional practice and now in the community that I run virtually, the reality I think for most of us as adults, and I don't mean this in any kind of derogatory shaming fashion, I'm included in this group of people we really struggle to tolerate stress and to tolerate our emotions and really kind of habits passed down through generations where many of our parents weren't even in my field taught around emotions, that emotions in children exist, that they're foundationally important, that our developing nervous systems needs, needs that safe, secure point of contact to help our bodies regulate and develop in all of our brain structures and beliefs that, that then get ingrained in us when we don't have that. And then what that translates to is us as adults, we really struggle to tolerate stress and upsetting experiences, to tolerate our emotions. Now, we all have an adaptive way that we've learned, right? To turn our attention away, to keep it repressed, to keep us, as I did for decades, focused on maybe achieving or doing, right? Distract it from our emotional world. Though the reality of it is our emotions still exist. So really simply, emotional resilience is our ability to be present to our emotions, to truly understand that they are energies, physiolo physiologies, hormones, neurotransmitters, neuropeptides that live in our body. And this is, I think, where for me, it was groundbreaking shift to understand even as a clinical psychologist, we can't logic or reason our emotions or ourselves into an emotionally resilient individual. We really have to include our body and our body's ability to tolerate stress and dysregulating upset that many of us are living with constantly. I just got a dopamine hit. I'm just so happy to be here. Dave, what are you smiling at? Oh, well, I mean, like uh, birds fly together and to end the year uh, is just an incredible experience. And so grateful that you joined us. And it wasn't a surprise to me when you said you read The Course in Miracles every day, uh, which I've, this is coming on my eighth year. Although it took a long time to do it every day, uh, talking about emotional resilience and, uh, you know, understanding your book and the work that you're doing is aligned with this distance that emotions create. And the distance is between our behaviors and it can be 
uh, an impactful uh, bioanatomical, biochemical, uh, conscious, subconscious, quantum, and the unconscious as well, uh, genetic, energetic, inherited. But this distance is real simple to me when we're talking about the interfering emotions. And you uh, have explained with love and in the Course of Miracles, Craig, I know you're just starting on the journey. You know, forgiveness is a reflection of love in the Course and uh, understanding how uh, these reflections or projections occur. But the distance between our behaviors, uh, which have that conscious, subconscious, unconscious, bioanatomical, biochemical uh, effect or impact, is relative to a distance of the consequences, results um, that we attach our emotions to. And this is what creates the interference uh, that then creates cortisol or creates all these other things biochemically and bioanatomically. And so I want people as they come into their own growth and their own journey to understand that if we can shorten the distance between our behaviors and results, consequences, outcomes, uh, and the emotional attachment to it, that we now are clearing what interferes with the source, uh, that interferes with the omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing, that dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins will flow, the ease that we live in, and, um, I think there's a huge difficulty that people have between, and I call it the ferocious Buddha, which Craig knows, they, they just can't understand how you can live your life ferociously, but be Zen and allowing life to happen. And it lies within the context of that distance, that emotion that we put into the outcome, the consequences and results, instead of the behaviors by identifying what we're doing to interfere with the omniscient, all-powerful, or the infinite, abundant, unified system of love or truth uh, that everyone's in. And so wherever you are in your journey, I just encourage you to chase or to uh, pursue understanding. And this, your third book is an extraordinary example and illustration so that people can resonate with a different paradigm shift, no pun intended, Craig, but a different perspective on living at ease and, and being happy. And I just am so grateful for the work that you've done because everyone speaks differently and uh, in different frequencies and it just resonates with so many people, the work that you're doing. And I love when I read a book and say, yes, she's writing a book in a different language. Uh, yeah, it's in English and probably many other languages as well, but a different frequency at least. And so many more people, many more millions uh, will live at peace, at ease, at harmony. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I appreciate that. I want to go back to and just clarify something because I think it applies as we're getting ready for a new year and I think all the expectations that comes with that. I lied a bit when I said I read it every day because the reality of it is there are some days where I fall back into my old habits, which means I don't do this beautiful morning routine that I created for myself that I know brings me grounding and shortens the distance between me and my emotions and allows me to be ferociously zen. And speaking that to say, because I think we're at a time of year where we put such an expectation on ourselves that we change our life from top to bottom, beginning on January 1st, and then we maintain these new habits. And when we don't, many of us fall back into lifelong patterns of shaming ourselves, of betraying ourselves by not keeping our commitments, of feeling like something is broken or wrong with us, or we're not deservant of all these beautiful topics that the three of us are talking about here today. So clarifying it to say our body and again going back to the holistic model of even change our body while it can change and we can rewire our mind our physiological experiences throughout our lifetime our nervous system feels so protected in our habitual patterns so saying that to say for all of us as we go to look to the new year whether january 1st is really significant or whether it's just another day Anytime we set an intention to create change, we have to understand that we're going to be working with that natural physiological resistance. The difficulty with actually actualizing or embodying those changes. So I think our, our best way to address that is not to shame ourselves, as we will fall back on old habits, which might not look like the intentions that we set. And to create really small, doable practices that we can embed in our day-to-day -day life. Because what we're really trying to do is shift our habits. And habits are consistent choices we make over time. Not things that we white-knuckle until you know, January 15th and then we fall off the wagon and we're right back 
into those whole habitual patterns. So again, just as always using myself as a teaching moment, um, we don't always actualize our intentions, though I loved your point, David, when you kind of using ourselves even, whether it's the previous year or maybe a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago as our own litmus test. How am I different? Not how am I comparing to the world around me? How are my habits stacking up to everyone else's, right? How, what are the small ways that I'm different? And we can then begin to see those changes because I think we minimize those just as much as we expand all these expectations we put on ourselves, we minimize the actual progress that we make. Yeah, this is exactly why I wanted you as the finale. This is so relevant and, and so timely. And one of the many things I love about you is how authentic you are. Just the fact that you just came on to, to correct yourself <laughs> from five minutes ago. And one of the things that you also talk about, which has been the biggest breakthrough in my life, is reconnecting to your true authentic self. How does somebody do that, Nicole? This is a question, Craig, that I get so often. And I think a lot of us are looking, I'm, I often give frustrating answers, I think, for many people. Because I think so many of us are looking for, oh, what is the, you know, roadmap? What are the one, two, three, four steps? How do I know if what I'm feeling or instinctually driven to do in this moment is coming from my intu intuition or whether it's coming from all of these habits and patterns or the conditioning, as I called it, that have been created and repeated across time. And the reality of it is there is no simple step one, step two, step three, or here are the ways that this feels different than that. Because the reality of it is our conditioning for so many of us creates, as you kind of even um, uh, affirm, David, in so many ways, a neurophysiological kind of compulsion, right? We feel, whether it's the fear or the anger or whatever emotion it is and the you know, habit that we wanna discharge when we feel that, it does feel like it's coming from that guttural, instinctive, authentic place because we are the embodiment of all of those habits and patterns that we've been repeating from the thoughts in our mind or the consistently assigned meanings that you know we've been repeating about ourselves, about our relationships about the world around us we've been repeating this physiological biochemistry so much so that we wake up in our adulthood and it's hard to tell the difference so the way back to our intuition and to begin to distinguish what is that authentic space really is the kind of peeling of the onion analogy becoming really consciously present. I will always cite presence, consciousness, awareness, whatever word it is for each of you listening as the foundation of change, beginning to pay attention to what are those narratives running through my mind? What are those physiological sensations running through my body? What are then the habitual behaviors that I've learned to try and cope with that internal world? And the more conscious I become of what I would call then my conditioning, those repetitions, those neural pathways that we've been kind of over time just relying on as a habit, now I can start to reconnect with what I believe is the true source of my intuition, my deeper body, right? My deeper self, learning how to even be still and present with my physiology and create safety where I'm not feeling like I need to distract my attention away or I'm not overwhelmed by the energies that so many of us have stuck in our bodies, then I can start to rely a little more on my body as the intuitive sensor that it is for us and the world around us. What a dynamic powerhouse, huh, Dave? Amazing. Uh, and as a reminder to that, even at the beginning, the simple things to do are simple not to do. Yeah. Uh, and so all of these behaviors uh, that aggregate uh, and raise our awareness to the 40,000 of the same thoughts that we have. And, you know, it's so interesting as we're building our authentic self or what our essence is. For me, I'm more pragmatic about helping people uh, to get a subjective opinion with objective criteria. What I mean by that is if you take inventory of your own skills, which is part and parcel of your fingerprint that you are on this earth, your own knowledge and the knowledge of not only what you know, but who you know, which has become more important today than ever because of the size, scope, and scale of the addressable community uh, that we have at your frequency or the addressable neighborhood that you can communicate with. And then, of course, on the intuitive and emotional level, your desires. And so uh, if you take inventory each day of here's the skills, the knowledge, and the desire, 
we can get a greater clarity of who we are, what our essence is, and we can be consistent with that frequency, which then creates a clearer message, a stronger uh, signal and a wider reach uh, to this total addressable community to be able to communicate with and empower uh, to and through. And so I think it's really important, um, this word authenticity, especially in branding and marketing, uh, really gets confusing, especially to young people. They're, they're looking for some unique, I'm always honest. Well, anyone that tells you they're always honest, they always tell the truth is full of shit. Uh, they don't study history. They don't still study human nature. Um, unfortunately, as human beings, we lie intentionally for good purposes. We lie unintentionally uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and we also lie intentionally sometimes out of scarcity or fear. And so if we take inventory of ourselves and we live within the context of progress, not perfection, I think the frequency of who you are will come out and you'll realize what other people think is none of your business. Who I am is most important. And what I'm doing to interfere with who I am is even more important than that. And that would create a greater understanding of your essence, your authenticity. Yeah, you said. Um, we'll land the plane with, with a final nugget. Uh, this is always a good topic. <laughs> That's our signal for landing the plane. <laughs> Craig's been doing it for like 145 episodes. I'm still trying to figure out how that's landing the plane, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm a strange cat. I I'm trying to be my most authentic self. You're uh, an eagle. You're not a cat. You're an eagle. <laughs> Nicole, you talk about doing the ego work. And I know we touched about that a little bit during this conversation so far, but the ego is something that's always there. Uh, what kind of ego work do you do and, and how do we tame it? So our, yeah, our ego, I think that's, and I'm, I'm glad to some extent to see how much ingrained in our global conversation ego has become. Though I think with that, I think a lot of us maybe have the misinterpretation that the idea is that it shouldn't be there. It's bad if it's there. The goal is to get it to go away. And the reality of it is the ego is, is a function of really simply what I call our thinking mind the fact that our brain, our mind, the function of our brain is always trying to make sense of the world, to gain a sense of control, a sense of predictability. And we, as an individual, are one of our points of focus. We're trying to make sense of who we are. And that begins in childhood. And so really simply, the ego is, can be met on the daily for most of us as that little voice inside of our head that's narrating usually all these deep rooted beliefs that we've ingrained within us about who we think we are based on how we were meant to be, how we were meant to feel, the things we were made to or directly or indirectly express or not express in childhood. So the ego in a sense then becomes a identity of the self that plays a very protective role, right? Because on a deep level, those modifications, those ways that we had to shift or change ourselves, suppressing certain feelings if we got told we were being dramatic or being too much or too little of something, suppressing certain aspects of our own self-expression. In childhood, when we're dependent, we need it to construct that version of an identity to maintain these connections that we desperately need over time. And the reality of it is we don't shift in terms of we always need to be belong, to be a part of a system that's greater than an individual. So in a way, this constructed identity is our lifeline, or so we think, into certainty of knowing who we are, and then a certainty of knowing how it is that we can maintain the connections that we need, not only for our physical survival, but for our emotional survival. So again, I go into the, the explanation of at least the way I formulate and think about what the ego is, because if we do have the idea that the goal is to remove it to not have that voice in my mind we're going to set up an expectation that's just not attainable because again there's a protective stance that neurology those neural pathways we fired for so long so frequently we come to believe it's true about ourselves they're not going to go away immediately when we start to pay attention but what will happen is we'll create a bit of space so again, it's that same shift of focus. Well, what's going on in my mind? How am I narrating myself? What do I think of myself? What am I assigning meanings when people are doing or not doing something in relationship with me? What do I assume it means 
about me and who I am. And the more I pay attention, and this goes back to a little bit of honesty. And I was smiling, David, when you were talking about honesty, because the first person that many of us struggle to be honest with is ourselves. Before we're directly or indirectly lying to the people around us, and this applies, I think, to the ego or conversation, we're not able to be fully honest with what it is that we think about ourselves, with what it is that we come to believe about ourselves, with all of the deep rooted pain that those thoughts and beliefs really were born out of. So by paying attention and being really honest, and for me, this is on the daily, dropping in, noticing what I think about myself, the way I'm narrating my happenings or non-happenings in the world around me, and then giving myself, because I've practiced that conscious state, the ability to see those thoughts without reacting to them, even the ability to drop in and notice the physiological shifts and changes. When I'm believing I'm not worthy, my body's becoming constricted. I might even become collapsed, right? Trying to kind of remove myself from focus. And when I notice both of those shifts in my internal world, including my body, now I can start to create a bit of space to not only question, because I think a lot of times that's what we hear in terms of ego work, well, question the validity of my thoughts, I can include my body in that conversation. I can shift and change the way I'm physiologically feeling, releasing the tension and constriction that comes with fear or unworthiness or unlovability so that now I can begin to show up in the embodiment of a new belief, even before those ego voices or thoughts or beliefs fully go away. Because again, I think that's an expectation we have. Oh, I have an ego. I'm paying attention to it away it'll go. Those thoughts won't come. I won't assign those narratives anymore. And, or I'll begin to feel differently immediately. And that's just not the case. We have to rewire our mind and our body. And that's how we do it through that conscious awareness of what's happening in our mind and our body. And then the intentional choice to shift focus from narratives that aren't helpful and to regulate our body or shift our physiology in a way that is. Dave, before I hit the to you, I just want to say uh, that's why a little more unenlightened version of me would say squash the ego, but that's why I use the word tame. I know it does serve a purpose, and I just want to acknowledge you. Obviously, you're brilliant, but you make such complex um, concepts so easy to digest and consume. And I personally learned a lot already in this conversation. Dave, I know you want to say something. Oh, no. I mean, I think uh, along the lines of the ego, it's the prescription that human nature gives to fear. Uh, and it fills a void, uh, which I'm most concerned of with our children and as a father of four between I am and this is what I want people to think I am. And so these needs of the ego have changed over the years, evolved. It's not just being chased by a saber toothed tiger anymore. Uh, it's a need to be right and a need to be offended, a need to be separate, inferior, superior, anxious, frustrated, angry, guilty, uh, all of these resentful all of these needs of the ego. And I think if you start practicing and, you know, I loved it the new year, I always give away uh, the five daily practices that help people uh, feel free to email me. I always throw in my book as well. I'm not a, a great author. I've written eight books. So I just decided to give them all away. It's a lot easier that way. Then you can feel popular. Uh, but uh, David at dmelter.com. Just email me. I'll give you these practices that help you one, identify ego, know that your mind, body, soul are on fire uh, when you have a need of the ego. But instead of resisting it, going over it, under it, through it, around it, denying it, lying to it, cheating it, simply just stop, breathe, drop down to center into that unbelievable, infinite, abundant, unified system of thought that we all belong to, and then roll back into the right trajectory. I see so many people uh, trying to give themselves, like Craig suggested, an egoectomy. I squash the, I can't, yeah, it's human nature. Uh, it's human nature to prescribe ego to when you're afraid. There's just different things to be afraid of today. And the biggest void in which it creates is between I am and I'm afraid I'm not what people think I am. And so therefore I widen the gap between I am and this is what I want people to think I am. And if we can help people heal that and provide love, and I would say, you know, both of your books, books are a great place to start, uh, to go ahead and understand, raise your own awareness to, when am I prescribing ego to get into my own way, to edge goodness or God out of my life uh, is a good start for a new year. Remember, today's impressions are tomorrow's expressions. 
Uh, and if we can utilize better impressions upon ourselves. I told Craig earlier this week, I had him as a guest. I said, Ben, if you realize 40,000 of the same thoughts are going through your head every day, 80% of them are negative. So you're doing, saying, thinking, believing, and feeling negative things. 90% of our 40,000 thoughts are repetitive every day. Just think statistically what you're doing to yourself. So if we can use these five daily practices, if we can use these books uh, that these two geniuses have written, you will find that we can shift those 40,000 repetitive thoughts and make them positive and actually shift our energetic and genetic inheritances as well as Dr. Nicole uh, has much more experience and credibility in explaining that side of the inheritance than I do. But I just want to bless both of you. Thanks for going over on time and giving me an opportunity. Everyone enjoy your new year. David at dmeltzer.com. I appreciate both of you and look forward to doing more with both of you next year. And Dr. Nicole. Cole, I just want to say, everybody grab this book. You can thank me later. Uh, the most important question I have for you is because I know how, wow, Dave, how do you do that? That's Early powerful, year. isn't it? I have no <laughs> idea. I have no funny. idea how that happened, but I like it. Dr. Nicole, I know how you are with your boundaries. So what are you doing for New Year's Eve? And will you be up at midnight? I, I actually, David, I'm going to take a, a learn from you. I love this idea of having a East Coast New Year's because I am a very early to bed person. Um, I get up early in the morning, so usually around as crazy as it sounds, 8 p.m. I'm in bed getting ready to go to sleep, which usually means New Year's for me looks like it's from my pillow. So I'm inspired to perhaps stay up until what would it be 10 p.m. I think now that I think the time changed. So maybe I can make it to 10 and begin to celebrate an East Coast New Year's. Um, otherwise, it'll look like for me as this past week has looked like a lot of resting, a lot of replenishing, um, a lot of the service of putting a book out into the world, you know, had a lot of emotions for me um, included in that experience, positive, negative, neutral, all of the things. So this past week has looked like a lot of downtime, a lot of centering moments, which is why I did get to read um, and do my morning routine this morning in particular. So New Year's Eve and New Year's Day will look like more of the same and perhaps I'll make it to East Coast New Year's, we'll see. <laughs> Happy and healthy New Year. Thank you so much for your residents, for joining us, for helping us land the plane on the final episode of the year. And so much love and respect for both of you. Uh, and happy and healthy New Year, guys. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. Brothers. Same to you both and same to all of you who have joined us today. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year. Bless and, you both. everybody grab this book, uh, Dr. Nicole's most recent book. Uh, it's awesome. Bye, guys. And, and, and thank you so much. Happy and healthy New Year. Uh, Dr. Nicole is really special, guys. She's awesome. Um, grab her book, The Hours, The Reinvention Formula as well, uh, both best sellers this year. And we're giving away for the first time ever a free goal setting blueprint for 2024 for free. All you have to do is the first 100 people that text the number at the bottom of the screen, 917 634 3796. Um, I will give you the link to, to a free masterclass on how to set your intentions and goals that actually manifest into fruition for 2024. Just text the number at the bottom of the screen. And just again, guys, I just want to thank Dr. Nicole for what an awesome conversation. She's so special. She's doing so many amazing things. My partner in crime, Big Dave, uh, no weeks off in just, just under three years, 145 episodes in a row. 2023 um, has been epic, transformative, expansive, but also had its challenges as well. We actually dropped a solo episode on the podcast, The CLF Experience, today on uh, the 2024 blueprint and some of the challenges that I did face over the year because not every year is perfect by any means. None of us are perfect. Um, so uh, just so grateful that you guys join us every single Saturday. Let us know what other guests you'd like to see on the show, um, what some of your favorite takeaways were from this conversation as well. Uh, it'll post our account after and, and I'd love to hear more from you guys and just so super pumped. Um, I see a bunch of you guys asking in the chat what my book is. Our book is called The Reinvention Formula, How to Reinvent Yourself. And then uh, Dr. Nicole's book is, and also by Dave's book as well, Connected to Goodness. Um, and lastly, guys, you can text the number at the bottom of the screen again, 917-634-3796, and we'll send you a link to a free goal-setting and manifesting blueprint, uh, the first 100 people. I love you guys. Thank you for your resonance. Thank you for being here. Um, I hope you guys have a healthy, safe, prosperous, abundant, uh, peaceful um, and fulfilling uh, New Year's. 
and let's get ready for the biggest year ever. Uh, love you guys.